I didn't know if the introducer told you that I never prepare a talk. So the best way, if I do prepare a talk, I'll be telling you the things that I want to tell you. So the best way to go around that is for you to ask me whatever question you'd like. And from there, I'll carry on speaking. So what shall we speak about tonight? Questions. You know, the deeper the question, the better. Or anything for that matter. The silence before the storm. Yes. Very um, difficult for me. I'm a very viper, and I'm just I'm here out of interest. I felt maybe. Uh -huh. uh, well, what we normally do here is I would give a talk for about an hour and then we have a 10 minutes break and then small little questions and problems. We have a rapid fire session we ask these questions, but nevertheless it's a very valid question. Uh, any more? Because I could tackle half a dozen of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Richard, you mentioned in one of your talks that the path of the way and the goal are one and the same. Mm -hmm. Good. As each and every one would desire in his life, peace, calm, and happiness, consciously or some subconsciously, that is what you want. So with all the external search we have made to find that, we have been unsuccessful. External search means that in the material world, but we have reached the limit, especially in our modern technology, and now for man to find peace, he has to turn inward. But most of the teachers say, meditate, turn inward, take your eyes within you. That is very true, but only partly true. Uh, from this, all the theologies of the world, we learn that seek ye first the kingdom of heaven within, and all else shall be added unto thee. That is a very great truth. But we that live householders' lives, uh, such as having a family and children and a home and jobs to look after, we cannot forever dwell within that kingdom of heaven. We have to interpret and translate it in the daily action of life. And that daily action of life uh, which comprises thought as well, is the path. Hmm? And the goal would remain the happiness and peace that we seek within ourselves. The mind is forever filled with turbulence all the time. Hmm? One thought rushes upon the other, and the turbulence increases as the waves of the ocean. Hmm? So how can there be any relaxation whatsoever? Hmm? For it is only through the relaxation of the mind that one's body could be relaxed. Hmm? For if the mind is filled with thoughts and you do all kinds of hatha yoga, which only forms a very minute section of what yoga really is. Yoga means union. Union with what? Hmm? Not only union with divinity, which is the goal, the aim of life, but also the integration between the body, mind, and the eternal spirit that is within us. Hmm? 
So as I said at a talk last night, that man functions very fragmentedly. One thought pulls this way and another thought another way, and uh, you are in a turmoil. You do not know if you are coming or going. Hmm? There were two newspaper editors uh, that happened to meet outside the door of a psychiatrist. So the, they knew each other, both being editors of newspapers in the same city. This is, um, he said, one asks, what are you doing here? Are you coming or going? So the other editor replies, if I knew, I would not be here. We don't know if we are coming or going. And that is the cause of dissatisfaction, disillusionment, discontentment, and the suffering that is within, which results in all the various diseases that you suffer from, psychosomatic diseases, uh, heart problems, blood pressure, the entire nervous system is taut, so unrelaxed, migraines. These are just but outer manifestations of something that is wrong within you. Now, what could be wrong within you? Good. The human being is composed of three parts. We call it parts for the purpose of explanation. It is actually one continuum. The body, the subtle body that is within one, and then the spiritual self. It is one continuum, one at a gross level, while the other at a very fine level. Now, the intermediary between the physical body and the spirit is the subtle body, which we could also term the mental body. Unfortunately, psychologists and psychiatrists um, know very little about the subconscious mind. And, uh, for example, they treat you with Jungian psychoanalysis. But what does, it, what does that do for you? Nothing. Because through that probing, you're only shifting around energies in the subtle body. So you get rid of a toe ache, and you create a heart ache, or a tummy ache, shifting of energies. The whole idea of spiritual practices is to dissolve the cause of all our problems so that we could become totally relaxed. And the way to dissolve the cause of our problems is the path that leads us to the goal of peace within ourselves. Hmm? As the scriptures would say again, to find that peace that passeth all understanding. So what does this mean? Does this mean that the peace could never be found by intellectualization or by rationalization? For with every pro there would be a con, every question that arises in the mind, and as soon as you find the answer, a half a dozen other questions would arise from the one answer, and then you need half a dozen other answers. And when they are answered, another two dozen questions arise, and so you, instead, instead of landing in fusion between mind, body, and spirit, you land up in confusion. Hmm? So the process would be, in order to still the mind, would not be the mind itself. To, re to relieve yourself of tensions and stresses, it just becomes unbearable. You go through experiences as if you are going insane, 
torn apart. So, although the mind is a necessary tool, it cannot supply you the answers to all your problems. So, what do we do? We have to go beyond the mind and through a systematic scientific process we can go beyond the mind and become the observer of the workings of the mind. And when you, the real you, not the little you, the, not the little ego you, hmm, that causes all this trouble, hmm, when the observer observes the little you, the little you of me and mine, hmm, observes it, then all the actions of the mind gains no foothold. And gradually, as it gains no foothold, it becomes cleansed. And all those impressions in the subconscious layers of the mind gathered through this entire lifetime or even through previous lifetimes, if one believes in that, hmm? comes to the fore and that, those very impressions are the ones that motivate you in the kind of actions you do. So the greatest troublemaker is that storehouse of impressions which psychologists call the subconscious mind. Hmm. So, through a systematic process, using the conscious mind, we delve deeper and deeper through the layers, through the various layers of the subconscious, and then we reach a stage which is called the superconscious mind, of which psychologists, as far as today's knowledge goes, know very little about. The most they could talk about is altered states of consciousness, and consciousness can never be altered. Consciousness is one. Consciousness is being, and that being comprises the entire universe. If being is omnipresent, then he is in every cell of your body, in every cell of your mind, hmm? the superconscious mind, and the works, and everything, because that force call it divine energy, call it God, call it whatever you want to, it, there are but labels. But there is a force. Mm -hmm. There is a force that keeps this whole universe together. Mm -hmm. Now, this force could never be really defined by the conscious level of the mind because the mind is limited, it is finite, and nothing which is finite or fragmented could ever explain that which is infinite, but that infinity, that eternity, could be experienced. Mm -hmm. I was giving an example the other day to a young man I see this beautiful plant or flower growing. What is it that brings to it, after the seed has been planted, what is it that brings to it the right amount of minerals from the earth, the right amount of air, the right amount of water, heat from the sun that would make this plant thrive and grow and bloom in this beautiful flower? What force is there that gives all the things required in its proper proportion? What force is there? Of course, this young scientist could not explain that. He said it just happens automatically. 
Mm? But nothing in this world happens automatically. Mm? There must be an energy that functions within its own nature which would be automatic and that would add to the automatic precision of the running of this universe. And when you feel not relaxed at all, and when you're seeking for the path, to search for the path to the goal of peace is a great endeavor. You only search when you find that you are not at peace and not relaxed. Then only would you search for the path. Otherwise, why would you? I have been and taught around the world. I travel seven, eight months a year around the world giving talks and lectures at educational institutions, universities, plus other various organizations, including our own organization, uh, which goes under the name of the International Foundation for Spiritual Unfoldment. Remember the word unfoldment and not development, for you are fully developed as you are. You are divine. We'll come to that a bit later. Good. So under the umbrella organization of IFSU, we have all these various organizations throughout the world. In Britain, we call it the British Meditation Society. In the States, the American Meditation Society. In Denmark, the Danish. In Spain, the Spanish. And Germany, the German. It goes on and on through various countries of the world. Fine. And so, this organization has been established for one purpose only, so that a person can find that peace that is inborn within him. And that requires a relaxed attitude of mind and body. I was speaking in the East not so long ago, a few years ago, and I had an audience of 30,000. This was in Bombay, on Juhu Beach, Chopati. I told them that forget your spirituality, but make your fields more productive and your factories more productive. Why go through this dire poverty? For if your stomach has hunger pains, how could you ever put your mind on divinity? Hmm? So many of your philosophies are wrong. There has to be a total balance in man's life. The external things, the necessities of life. If you are a rich man, why not become wealthier? Hmm? And if you're a poor man, get away from that poverty through self-effort, but at the same time remember that everything is divine. Hmm? This microphone is divine, this table is divine, this flowers, this chair I'm sitting on, everything is divine. For the very molecular structure in this piece of metal or this piece of wood, is the same molecular structure that is within me. And when one finds the unity between everything existing, then you become a self-realized person. And a self-realized person is an integrated person whereby his body, mind and spirit functions in totalness functions, in totality. And that is what we are seeking for, to function in totality. And then all our actions in life becomes dynamic, hmm? where less effort is required to achieve the maximum. We don't get hassled 
we don't get flurried, we don't get impatient with this greater tolerance within you in your daily life. And when that comes about, you feel also the qualities of kindness, of compassion. And that is what Jesus meant when he said, if someone smacks you on one cheek, offer the other. Why? Why should you offer the other? A man would ask. Is because you find, as Einstein would say in his unified field theory, that everything is a unity, a wholeness, and a man, uh, the stature of Jesus, a great spiritual master, finds that what lies within the man that slapped me also lies within me. Hmm? So if he uh, is one with me, then who is slapping me? I'm slapping myself. Mm -hmm. So here we proceed from total dualism mm -hmm. to unity. From diversity we proceed, we proceed to unity. For that, if you are not unified within yourself, if you are not integrated within yourself, how can you find integration with the world around you. Now, we can take the profoundest philosophies. Now, what I've said so very simple constitute the most profoundest philosophies in the world. But they can be stated very simply if you have gone through those experiences yourself. And the profoundest truth can be put into the simplest words. And not only that, any deep philosophy is useless if it, if it cannot be translated into daily living, daily action, daily thought. Hmm? So, through meditation and spiritual practices, what we do through a scientific method, we take the conscious level of the mind, through the layers of the subconscious, and we reach that clear area called the superconscious mind, which is at the finest point of relativity. And then when you go there, through the process of the mind, the mind, though, may be a most damaging instrument, and yet, it could be the most helpful for what other tool have you. Hmm? It's like putting a knife in the hand of a, um, a loafer, a bad person. He would just kill a person with it, but that very sharp instrument in the hands of a good surgeon, he could save someone's life hmm? by performing an operation. So, how we use the tool of the mind is important. Hmm? So, we, we take our mind, the conscious little mind that we have, and that conscious little mind is very, very small. Hmm? In this little brain box that we have, this brain grey matter, weighing two and a half pounds or three pounds perhaps, hmm? it contains 12 billion cells, and we are only using one millionth of 12 billion cells. So it just shows that all that capacity is there within each and every one, just to be explored. And how can you go about, you know, bringing to life those dormant, mm, 11.9999999 billion cells. How can it? It'll take you many lifetimes. It'll take you 200, 500 million years to do that. But there is a simple way. There is a simple way. 
where very systematically you reach the area of the superconscious, the area of light, although being at the highest form of relativity, it is like clear glass through which the light of the Absolute shines through, and the light is so powerful that it overcomes the darkness of the subconscious mind and filtrates through to the conscious mind, which in turn influences your thought, and thought becomes action. For thought too is matter, Hmm? a very subtle matter, perhaps not perceptible by the man in the street, but thoughts could be seen as a subtle matter. And we know that thoughts exist, don't we? Because we think thoughts, they exist. And yet, can anyone prove a thought? Can anyone show me, here is a thought, look at it? Hmm? No. In the same way, the subconscious level is there. Hmm? And it can be experienced. It can be made tangible by no one but you yourself. Hmm? I'm fond of saying in lectures that a real spiritual master, he does not shine the light upon you. Hmm? He shines the light upon the path so that you do not stumble and fall. Hmm? That is what it does, he does, but the walking you have to do. And the path is so simple, so straight. The human mind, because of all the old impressions lying there, try and make things very complex, when in reality things are so, so simple. I have a very favorite saying, it is so simple to be happy, but so difficult to be simple. Yeah, so simple to be happy, but so difficult to be simple. So what we have to bring into our lives, although enjoying all the material gains, we have that beautiful simplicity. And that is what is meant in the scriptures, when they say, be like a child before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Simplicity, humility. Those are all blood brothers. Hmm? Now, these are the practical aspects of daily living which spiritual practices and meditation bring about in you without effort and totally spontaneously. Now, that is the secret. Any person who's forced to do something will have to do it. Auntie Mary, she is ill in hospital, and being your aunt, you find it your duty to go and visit her in hospital, take her a bunch of flowers, fruits, whatever, yet in your heart you feel, oh, how odious this is. I don't feel like going there. I'll rather go and see a movie, or the ballet, or whatever, that'll give me more pleasure. But you go and see Auntie Mary, hmm? because you find it a duty. Now, are you really going to see Auntie Mary? No. Your mind wants to do something else. So that action of yours is a false action. There's no truth in it. It is not a true action. Hmm? But because of circumstances, or because being the only nephew or niece of the childless Auntie Mary, it might be profitable. Hmm? Hmm. People think about wills. 
and you'd never know how many ills there are in wills, huh? Mm. And what it could produce. Nevertheless, but if you are an integrated person, apart from the will or whatever, she could be the person, you could be supporting her actually and paying the hospital bills. I don't know how it is done in Canada. Uh, nevertheless, if you are an integrated person, there is something that comes in your life very spontaneously, and that is that thing called love. You love, you love, and you love, and you love. Hmm? And that love uh, takes you to see Auntie Mary in hospital. So it becomes a spontaneous action and not an action that has been premeditated upon and deliberated or debated upon. Shall I go or shall I not go? I'm going to miss the ballet. Mm -hmm. But you might miss Auntie Mary, she might pass over the same night. Mm -hmm. So, we go through life and our mind, the little conscious mind, is mostly centered upon our ego self. The little I that thinks that it's the cat's whiskers. I am Jane, or I am Jack, I'm James, I'm Jean. Hmm? No, that is not you. That is not really you. The big eye that is within you, that resides within you, is the real eye, your real nature. And the real eye within you is divine. The small eye is but a superimposition upon divinity. It veils divinity, and that is why, although divinity is omnipresent, he has not been lived. He remains as a belief system. He remains a conception of people's minds. And some believe, some religions believe, that divinity, call it God, Okay, God is someone sitting up on a throne with a long beard and looking down with a couple of hundred clerks writing down what John, Jack and James is doing. Hmm, fine, and the day of judgment will come. Then we'll check you. Hmm? At what you have done, good or bad. Fine, then other religions believe again that deity is um, someone with four arms. Hmm? And those are conceptions. I say that if there are 4,000 million people in this world, there should be 4,000 million religions. Of course, you could be the under the umbrella of any religion. Hmm? Nothing wrong with that. But you formulate your own path. You find the truth for yourself, for no one can show you a reality except you yourself. Because all the realities we know of are but mental conceptions, like the conceptions we have of various deities. Hmm? But the real self, the true self, and every word I speak about is not from books. It is through personal experience where I too, like the great master, could say that I found my father, that my father and I are one. I found that unity consciousness, and I found through years and years of practice trudging the various Himalayas sitting at the feet of yogis and gurus and various kinds of masters. Hmm? I've learned and learned and practiced until the fragmented mind became integrated. Because as a young boy, hmm, I, I ran away from home at the age of four in search of God. 
and after many months my parents found me hmm, ragged and barefooted on in a village street. I spent my nights in a, in a temple and uh, the gods there in the form of statues. Never speak to me, ask them so many questions, they don't talk. Hmm? I want a God that could speak to me and answer me. Hmm? Although in those temples I had a good old time. See, when they go to temples in the East, you always take an offering of fruit. Hmm? Well, I thought if these stone gods won't eat them, why not I? So I had a nice time. Good. So, I wanted a God that could speak to me and answer me. And I learned so many things from various gurus, which was more an intellectualism, rationalization, and through all the various paths of dualism, qualified non-dualism, total non-dualism, monism, etc. And I studied Hegel and Kant and Descartes and Schopenhauer and, of course, the classical Greek philosophers, Aristotle and Plato and Aristophane, you may name them Pythagoras, the works. Hmm? And then I reached the point of saturation. I threw all the books away. They showed me nothing. They only, you know, made me think. And the more I thought, the more did I find myself to be ignorant. Hmm? The more I learned, the more I found that there's so much more to learn. So what should I do now? Hmm? Until I met my guru, Swami Pavitranandji. And for the first eight months, I was at college, university, and most of the young men there would go away um, on vacation to their homes, wherever they come from. And I, I was a very popular young man, and I was always invited um, to various homes to spend the vacation. My parents were very not in a good position. I, and I ran away from home in search of God. Um, and then I worked in film studios, doing various kinds of jobs to pay my way through university. But yet the yearning was there, the craving was there. I would toss and turn in bed at night, Sweat weary, God, I want you, I want you, I want to know you. Until I met my master, Swami Pavitranand, and for the first eight months, he ignored me totally. During vacations, I never used to go to the homes of these rich friends of mine. I used to go up into the Himalayas and be with him. I used to miss certain semesters, but I was a brilliant student. So I got through my exams, and a very popular one. I was quite a bit of a handsome boy yeah, when I was young. Mm? All the little young girls following you around, and your phone would, would not stop ringing, especially associated to the film industry. Mm? So there are many reasons where I was well-liked, and and popular. And so what that did to me was this. It built up in me such an arrogance. Cat's whiskers, I'm this, I'm that. Hmm? Brilliant student. I used to manage all the stage plays of the university, compose music, write poetry, won some presidential goal awards for literature and this, that. So I was arrogant. That was my guru. He took no notice of me for eight months. The only thing he would shout is, why is that piece of paper lying there? Pick it up. Or do this, do that. Hmm? In the mornings, I had to get up at four o'clock in the ashram uh, to light the hookahs. I don't know if you know what a hookah is. It's a water pipe. 
is a, a pipe leading from it, a tube. But you can have a hookah that would have four or five leading from it. And of course you uh, put in water which acts as a filter. And you put in tobacco and a piece of burning coal on it so it would light up. And all those retired swamis in Almora in the Himalayas. So what a beautiful place you have the view of Nanda Devi, one of the peaks in the Himalayan range. And four o'clock I had to have it ready by quarter of four the latest. One day I, I slept till quarter of four, I didn't wake up. So my guru came along with a cane and started slapping me on the rear. Hey, what are you doing? Get up! I said, what kind of a guru is this fellow now? Not a kind word, nothing. Hmm? And then one day he said to me, come sit down. And I sat down and started meditating with him. Hmm? And two hours passed, it seemed like two minutes. And when I opened my eyes, everything was gold. There's a golden haze around, which still persists up to now, this very moment. The room is just filled with gold. Hmm? And that is the visual interpretation of divinity, and the heart is filled with love. In retrospection, I thought, why was my guru like that to me? But he had his reason. He wanted to break down my arrogance. Hmm? He wanted to break down my stubbornness, my arrogance. Hmm? He wanted to break down that ego that is the cause of all trouble. Hmm? So, according to scriptures, you lose your life to gain life. It means you lose your little self into the higher self that you really are. Hmm? Now, this does not mean, as some philosophers or philosophies teach, that the ego self must be totally annihilated. That is an impossibility. You cannot annihilate the ego. Even the most highly realized man, the self-realized man, must still have about two percent of ego in him. The reason being this, that while he is embodied, he can't be a hundred percent egoless or else he won't be able to do anything at all. He won't be able to walk. He won't even be able to go to the bathroom or eat or whatever. Hmm? So that two percent remains. That two percent is dissolved for the realized man on a different plane of existence when this gross outer body is shed. Well, that's a different subject. So. What we do is clarify the ego self, hmm? like a piece of rubber which is opaque, and through spiritual practices and a systematic method of meditation, you stretch the rubber so it becomes transparent. And because it becomes transparent, the light of the superconscious self shines through into the conscious level where your thoughts are spontaneously converted from hatred to love, from unkindness to kindness, and you feel it, you live it. And as, as I said a moment ago, we don't want conceptual gods created by the Brahmins or the rabbis or the founders of the churches. Hmm? that it misinterpreted things, hmm? misinterpreted things for organizational purposes, hmm? for organizational purposes only. Hmm? Look at the Council of Mycenae, I think 432 AD. Hmm? There are many things in the scriptures that have been left out for convenience, for convenience, for organizations, for the two richest organizations in the world are the churches and insurance companies. 
The church promises you heaven after death, and the insurance company promises you a large sum of money after you're dead. Hmm? What do you say? And they are the richest organizations in the world. Hmm? And yet, nothing is taught. Nothing is really taught. I had a press conference in London about two years ago. And I told them that I've come to fill churches and not to empty them. I want the mosques and the synagogues and the temples to be full and not emptied as they are today because of the fragmentation in people's minds. What do they do? They do things, activities hmm? that are mind-blowing. They go in escapism. They try and escape from reality, which they really are, because the ego self is so dirty, cluttered with all those impressions. Hmm? Tonight here, to listen to Guru Raj, who's come 12, 15,000 miles to speak to you, you have 15, 20 people. Then you go down the road here at your football stadium, the one that has a dome, with 22 people, grown-up men, who chase around a little ball. Hmm. As if that is going to bring them any sense of reality and what reality and life is all about. 22 grown-up men chasing around a little wall and 60,000 people shouting, come, take that ball, the goal. What goal? Those two posts. Is that the goal of life? But let them have the fun. Let them have diversion. Good to have diversions, but not escapism. Do not become an escapist. An integrated person through spiritual practice never escapes. He looks at, looks at himself squarely in the mirror and says to himself, Who am I? Ah, and that's the greatest question that could ever be asked by anyone. Who am I? And when you can answer that question to yourself, you also could say, I and my father are one. So, very spontaneously, all these wonderful qualities are developed in you. Mm? Love, kindness, compassion, and you live it so that you become not only a human being, but a living God on earth. We do not need conceptual gods. We need living gods. Hmm? And that has nothing to do with any religion. You can be a Christian, be a better Christian, a Hindu, a better Hindu, a Buddhist, a better, Hin a better Buddhist, but become a better human being. And it's so simple, spending one hour a day, half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening. And with us, of course, I don't know if the introducer told you, uh, that uh, with us it's not a mass form of meditational practices as is done throughout the world by many other organizations. Unfortunately, um, it gained some popularity because of promotion. Um, you buy a Colgate toothpaste. Why do you buy Colgate toothpaste? Because in the newspapers and the TV and all that, they hammer you into your mind, Colgate, 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 Colgate. Huh? And so you buy Colgate toothpaste. Yet, hmm? yet there could be another toothpaste that could be better. But it's not so much hammered, hammered into your mind. So these mass promotions and, and uh, just a certain path for masses could not be beneficial to people. For everyone is a unique person. There's no one bottle of medicine that could cure all diseases or ailments. 
So on the spiritual path, on the path to peace, the word spiritual has been so misaligned nowadays, hmm? but the path to peace, the peace that passeth understanding, that integration within oneself, that relaxation of calm mind and body, how to get rid of the stress and strain of daily living, Yes, the world today is very stressful, and therefore I started teaching since 75 around the world how one can cope with the stress. You can change yourself, you can't change the world. So like the poem F, hmm? can't remember the exact words, but the gist is this, that let the whole world go mad around you, and you keep yours still. Hmm? And that is true, for the scriptures say that also, be still and know that I am God. Huh? Yes. Okay. So we have individualized spiritual practices, and everyone is individually taught with the prescription that they do require, with the kind of medicines that they, that they require. Hmm? So, in other words, the spiritual practices, because no two people are alike, like no fingerprints are alike, the spiritual practices given to one would not be the same as the spiritual practices given to the other. Now, there are methods of doing this, and we have teachers um, throughout the world who are taught how to teach. Meanwhile, the like a doctor, I do the prescriptions, and our teachers are like the pharmacists that dispense the prescriptions or make up the medicines for you. you see, and that is the way, through an individual basis, great beauty could be appreciated, great love could flow, and it enhances joy within yourself, and not only within yourself, but you also, because everything emanates something all the time, you are emanating that joy and love to others spontaneously. And my favorite analogy, as some of you who have listened to some of my talks before, uh, it's like a flower. The nature of a flower is to be beautiful. But that's not the only thing it does. It also enhances the beauty of the garden. So your environment improves, your relationships improve with your husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, your friends, your job situation, or whatever you're doing. You look at things from a different perspective. Hmm? There are two men digging holes in the road. Hmm? So a passerby asked, the one, why are you digging that hole? He says, I'm digging here uh, a grave. So as he went on further, there was another man digging. He says, why are you digging there? So the man replies, I'm digging for the foundation of a cathedral. Hmm? So dig deep within your heart, not for the grave. Hmm but for that mag magnificent cathedral of love that goes beyond all the trials and tribulations of daily living. In the first place, you will realize how unreal they are. And when you start realizing that, you do not get affected by it, for you become non-attached to it, then you will truly understand the meaning of the biblical injunction hmm? to live in the world and yet not of the world. Hmm? So, these are some of the teachings. I've spoken for nearly an hour and a half, so what we'll do is have a ten minutes break, if you like. And then we'll start again, and this time the second half, uh, which won't last an hour and a half, of course, um, for an hour, and hour or so, a rapid fire question and answer. And you can ask me any question you like. 
as I said before, even how to bake a cake, yeah, anything, anything, anything. Good, fine. The second half will be interesting, will be full of fun and humor. And Okay, so see you in a few minutes. Always forget that. Good, shall we meditate for a moment, sir? Just to settle down. Om Shanti 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 Open your eyes slowly. Okay, let's hear some questions. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, um, There are three things, concentration, contemplation, and meditation. Concentration is when you use all the energies of your mind and become centered on one point, that is concentration. And in our spiritual practices, you are taught how to focus all the energies of your mind to a point without concentrating. Hmm? And because that requires concentration, requires a lot of energy, which is misspent when there are ways we could have a really concentrated mind without making any effort. So concentration is required because uh, the difference between success or failure in any, in, in any undertaking depends upon concentration. Now, contemplation is something different. Contemplation is taking a thought from A to Z without any break in between. It's like pouring oil from one vessel into another without a break. That is contemplation while meditation is something that leads you beyond the mind, where the mind is not used at all, it is used as an impetus only, where you are led beyond the mind in that region where, which we could call the storehouse of energy and draw there from. Hmm? Like the analogy I love using is, if you go and spend half an hour in a perfume factory, you will definitely smell like perfume. So that's meditation, when where you rise above the mind and you do not come back empty-handed. So you have concentration, contemplation and meditation. Uh, the word meditation, because of some societies that were very, very prevalent in the 60s and early 70s and associated with those rock and roll, Beatles, and all those things. You know, the, the word meditation has assumed not a very good meaning to it. It has been so misaligned. So um, through meditation, is something very, very different. Before, when you come out of the 20 minutes of meditation, you feel so invigorated, you feel like a new person. And the one hour of meditation is not all, that is just switching on, 
was just an impetus. It's how you feel the 23 hours of the day. That is important. Hmm? You sleep better because your mind is calmer, more relaxed. Uh, your daily work, you become more efficient in it. Hmm? And all the problems that are there, uh, for example, you work for a boss and he could be a terrible fellow um, and every day you feel like punching him in the nose. But um, if you are a meditator, uh, you have the stability within yourself that you just don't take notice of that or those that are under you. You know, they might not be doing their work well, so you don't get harassed and flustered. You call the person into your office and have a nice chat and it will make him a better person too by performing his duty well because he will feel that he is being understood and it's just not been trodden down. So in every way of life, um, you'd get angry in the morning because your wife burned the toast and you won't get angry after that. Oh, so well, you're busy with something and you forgot the toast. So what? It doesn't matter. So you develop that very, very positive attitude towards life. When you have the, the courage to do that, the strength that is built up within yourself brings you courage. It's like the story of three admirals. They met on this very vast, uh, big aircraft carrier. There was a Russian admiral, a German admiral, and a Canadian admiral. So the Russian admiral says, we have the greatest navy in the world. Hmm? So he calls one of his chaps, um, something of its whatever, and he says, look, you climb up the mast and dive down into the water, swim around the battleship and come and report to me. And this was duly done and the Russian admiral says, you see, the brave men, courageous men we have. So of course the German would not be outdone. So he calls one of his, Hansi, come here. Hmm? So Hansi comes, you know, yes sir, Herr hmm? Hitler. But before I finish the story, uh, Hitler went to a fortune teller and he asked uh, the fortune teller, when am I going to die? Can you give me the date of my death? So the fortune teller looks into the crystal ball and he says, uh, uh, yes, sir, I can tell you when you're going to die. You're going to die on a Jewish holiday. For the day when Jesus, um, oh my God. So the, the, the day when Hitler died, it must be a Jewish holiday. After exterminating six million Jews. Good, so um, the, the German called Hendrich and says, Look, you jump down the mast and you swim twice around the ship and come back and report to me. So he says, You see how brave you know, the German Navy is. But of course, then the Canadian had to show his turn. So, uh, he calls Davidson, come here. Davidson came along. Hi, Ad. Hmm? Davidson says, back to an admiral. Hi, Ad. Uh, he says, Davidson, what I want you to do is this. You shin up this ruddy mast. Hmm? You go up there and you dive down and you swim seven times around this aircraft carrier and come and report to me. And so. This guy says, Davidson, he says, he says, Ad, you mean to say I'm a shin up that mast and then dive down and swim seven times around the aircraft and come and report to you? You must be balmy, says this man to the admiral. Hmm? Why don't you do it yourself? So the Canadian admiral says, you see, this is supreme courage, if you can speak like this to an admiral. 
<laughs> Good. Next question. Yes. Uh, no, we don't teach cities at all. As a matter of fact, if you study the lives of Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, uh, Ram Tirsa, Raman Maharshi, Jesus, Buddha, Christ, and they said very, very explicitly, do not get involved in cities. For those that don't, don't know, cities mean certain occult powers. Uh, you do not get involved in them because that will be a stumbling block you know, on your path to divinity. It would be a stumbling block. Um, because, for example, if you're leaving your front door and you want to go to the garden gate to get out on the road to your car or whatever, then you have a beautiful lawn and flowers and rockeries in your garden. Naturally, as you pass them by, you admire the flowers, but you do not forget the goal of reaching there. And what is the sense of putting all your energies in cultivating these cities? Um, this, if you read Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, you'll find that there. There have been other organizations that uh, <clears throat> charge about three, four thousand dollars and uh, teach, teaches you to levitate. And I, with my travels around the world, I have not yet found anyone levitating yet. Hmm? And yet I have little young girls um, in our organization in Cape Town, 16, 17 year old girls, that would sit in a lotus position and jump. You know, they leap. But that's not levitation and neither is it flying. Yeah, there's a beautiful little article which I enjoyed so much in one of the South African newspapers. Here was a little girl up in the air, you know, and a photograph was taken, and uh, the caption was something like, is this girl levitating? Mm? So the article went on in a humorous vein, and then it ended by saying that she is the under-16 South African trampoline champion. Hmm? So you see these people, you know, and that's very easy, and with the fast cameras we have today, one thousandth of a second, so you hop up and you get pictured, and I believe this organization, the, the head of it, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, uh, I know him very well. As a matter of fact, he wanted me to take over the movement of TM in 74, and uh, I said, I'm very sorry because I do not agree with your principles. You're a very commercial organization. You have a list of 16 mantras which you dish out on age basis, which has no value whatsoever. That's not a mantra. Uh, you use the seed mantras called bija mantras, which you can find in any tantric work. They're all there. I could repeat them all to you now. Um, one day it happened where uh, um, I, you know, we initiated a group of university students, about, about 30 of them. And one day they must have gone into the bar and, and one of them might have had a beer, too many. So he blurted out his mantra and they all found, because being in the same age group, they all found that they had the same mantra. Yes. So I do not encourage any cities, but in your practice of meditation, and going to the deeper layers of the mind, you would be able to use vaster and vaster and more refined and therefore stronger energies. Uh, as I always say, if you throw down a 2,000 ton bomb, it will only make a big hole. But if you split a tiny, minute atom which the eyes cannot even see, you can blow up a whole city. Yes, I do not encourage cities at all. Uh, although I know, and wherever I go, wonderful things, some of my people that are here will tell you, the wonderful things happened around me, happen, happens around me. Even speaking to you tonight, 
uh, it's not only the wisdom that is conveyed, hmm? but there is a spiritual force that is conveyed to you, hmm? that enters directly into your heart for its unfoldment. But it's up to you to do the other part, to learn to meditate in a proper, systematic, individualized way, whereby you could uh, activate and keep uh, what has been activated in you tonight, to keep it in force and develop, uh, unfold further. So I am in total disagreement with any form of cities. Um, Yogi Bhajan, I believe he's quite well known, Yogi Bhajan. He has an ashram in a little town in the States, New Mexico somewhere, and his nearest airport is Albuquerque. And he's been inviting me, but I never had the time. I have no time to do this thing. I come out to work and every day is occupied with some program. Um, he, he was in London once when I was there and he invited me to his house. He's got a home there in London for dinner. So I went, I had a few people with me and he told me that Marishi, who wanted to invest six million dollars in publicity promotion, six million dollars to get a return of nine billion dollars. And of course, this was told to me by Yogi Bhajan. And I knew he had his facts straight. So, we're not interested in money making. I'm the poorest guru in the world. Hmm? For example, this hall tonight cost $200, and I don't think we've taken in $50 or $100. Hmm? Yes, eh? We are not money orientated at all. Although the local organizations in every country do ask when they want to learn to meditate for a donation, because they've got to cover expenses, there are lights and telephones and traveling petrol, you call it gas, gas and oil and what have you, stationery, it's a million and one expenses. So a donation is asked for. And if there's a person who cannot afford to give any donation, he's never turned away. Yes, it is a... So do not embark on the practices of Siddhi. Do not. If things happen naturally, in Preston, England, a lady was in, a, in an armchair, a um, wheelchair, for 13 years. She couldn't walk, and I saw something within her, and I just touched in front of a few hundred people. She started walking. Hmm? Here in America, near Chicago, uh, conducted uh, under medical supervision, there was a psychologist and physicist and physician and members of the various branches of medicine. Here one woman was deaf since childhood and uh, through the power of divinity, I'm only an instrument, I'm like a flute. He blows through it for the world to hear his divine melodies. I'm just that piece of wood. So through the grace of divinity, this woman could start hearing. Hmm? I could give you many, many examples like this. So because you're so deeply living in your real self, hmm? the spiritual self, still in the world, very simple. I eat, I hmm? go to the bathroom, I do this, I do that, like any ordinary person, and yet they're behind, at the back of it all, that stability, that stableness of divinity is always there. Hmm? There was a psychiatrist in Spain, Ramon Carballo. He was in a field where, um, and I was thousands, 12,000 miles away, he was in a field where a whole lot of dogs uh, that were trained, vicious dogs, trained to kill, and started attacking him, and uh, he didn't know what to do. Psychiatrist by profession, and a very well-known one in Spain, Madrid. And so the only thing he could do is think of me and shouted, Guru Raj, Guru Raj, Guru Raj, Guru Raj, he shouted. And the um, dogs just slinked down, burned around, and 
run away. You see the force of divinity. So if our lives are really truthful and sincere, sincerity of purpose and things, and all these powers come, but we don't attach anything. And that is why Jesus used to say, thy faith heals thee. He never said, I heal thee. Thy faith heals thee. These are things like that through my travels around the world. It keeps on happening. And in your spiritual practices, if you uh, find these powers coming to you through the grace of God, use them in a good way without the want of any name, fame or gain. And that is the way you would lose those powers. So, this is is a thing that I would never advise anyone to go in for. Mm. No one to go in for. No, it's a blockage. It will stop you. See if we can't find another joke, another joke or so. This young lady that was working in office, she um, was eating a cottage cheese sandwich. So friends that works in the same office happen to drop into the restaurant. And she says, uh, um, Maria, are you on a calorie diet? So Maria replies, no, I'm on a salary diet. (laughs) Yes, that's how much the office girls get paid nowadays. I'll try another one. This husband and wife were going on a holiday and they reached the airport. So they start checking the baggage. Well, those three cases, that set is yours and this, that one is mine and this is mine and that's mine. But we've got all our baggage together. So the husband says, uh, you know, we should have brought the kitchen table with so the wife says, why the kitchen table? What do you want to do with the kitchen table? He says, because the tickets were on them. <laughs> uh, good, next question. Uh, you, uh, there's one at the back there. Shall we take hers first? I think her hand went up first. Okay, yes. Ruthie, um, I have a question regarding the path. Um, in the, in the Eastern world, um, I understand from your uh, history that you seeked a master and truly totally found the master that was of your choice. In the Western world, as you don't know, we don't have that choice. But you said that the, your master lived the pathway so you could see how straight it was. He lived the path. Lit, lit the path. So you could see the path of but you wouldn't stumble, and you knew what your goal was for the pathway. Yes. Yes, in the Western world, what happens, many people say, what do I need a guru for? But if they examine their lives, they will find that when they are children, they go to school, you need a teacher. A guru is just but a teacher, but a spiritual teacher. When you go to school, you need a teacher to teach you A, B, C, D, and word formation. So the child learns to read by himself or herself. And when the child learn, can read by himself, he does not need the teacher anymore. Hmm? Like that, if you go to um, Leslie Janos over there, who is one of our teachers here in Vancouver, he is a concert pianist and also a teacher of the piano, the music teacher. Now, I'm sure he would be able to tell you that when you have a new pupil, you know, pling, 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 plong, the tonic sulfur, or whatever, and then afterwards when the pupil becomes accomplished, people would be able to play Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, whatever, so easily and spontaneously. So in everything in life, everything teaches us something. If the sun gives light to the whole world, a little lamp can at least give light to a little room. So everything I have found by practical experience is a teacher to me. Hmm? 
But a true spiritual master can sum you up. He can see your emotional state by the radiation that emanates from you. He can see your spiritual state. He can see your emotional state. He can see your physical state and guides you, gives you the proper kinds of practices, the proper medicine, in other words, so that your progress can be expedited. Um, what is the sense of having a shelf full of all kinds of different medicines and pills and you try and experiment with one bottle after the other. It could be fatal or detrimental. But if you have a doctor present who knows exactly which pill is suitable for you, then naturally uh, you'd be taking the right medication instead of um, experimenting. Yes, even if you're lost on a path somewhere, and you stop your car and you ask a passerby, uh, how do I, you might be battling up against a mountain there, and you ask, how could I reach the sea? And then you'll say, lady, uh, you turn to the right and turn left and right again, and you'll reach the sea. At that moment, that person guiding you is your guru. Hmm? If you go traveling on a long trip and you do not know the territory, you use a map. The map is your guru. Yes, eh? So, I've said this many times, over and over again, and it's been published in all our newsletters, and every center throughout the world send out newsletters, and the sub-centers then send out uh, their newsletters, and then we have the national newsletters, and they've, they've quoted me many, many times, that the purpose of the external guru is to awaken the internal guru within you. For the divinity that is within me is the same divinity that is within you. All I make you do is realize and experience that divinity with wisdom and practices and according to your needs and necessities. So you do not need to go on pilgrimages or go and visit holy temples or shrines. No, it is all inside here. It's all there. And that's all where you have to go to. <laughs> you know, this burglar had a son. Uh, and of course, he must have inherited uh, the uh, characteristics of the father who was a burglar. So one day, the father caught him stealing jam in the kitchen. So he gave the son a spanking. So the son said afterwards, but dad, I know what kind of work you do, and why did you spank me? He says, the father replies, he says, I did not spank you for stealing the jam, but I spanked you for leaving your fingerprints. <laughs> Next question. You know, the little grandson came to visit his grandparents in Vancouver. And so there's a very busy cathedral here somewhere where they have three services a day. One at 10 o'clock, one at 1 o'clock, and the third service at 4 o'clock. Meanwhile, as they approach the cathedral up the steps, there's a beautiful bronze plaque with names written in alphabetical order. So this young lad, the grandson, asks Grandpa, he says, uh, Grandpa, what's that supposed to be? So Grandpa explains that this is a plaque, uh, a memorial plaque, uh, for, the, for the men who died in service. So the grandson asks, which service? The 10 o'clock, 1 o'clock, or the 4 o'clock? <laughs> Good, next question. We believe in one thing, life, love and laughter. And you're okay. Oh yes, of course, lady, you, you, you're after. Don't tell me you've forgotten the question. No, I'm sorry. No, I 
I was going to ask if you encourage the practice of yoga on all of meditation or whether they are. Uh, I didn't get that. If you have the courage, encourage. Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes. If you're inclined uh, for Hatha Yoga, that is what you are referring to, because yoga is a very wide term. It includes many, many things. The word of yoga, as you would know, is the union between man and, and his God, the union between the finite with the infinite. That is yoga. Now, Hatha Yoga are a set of exercises uh, that are very helpful to the physical body. Um, uh, for example, physical exercises would stimulate the muscles of the body, while the yoga postures are more aimed at the massage of the internal organs, the, pardon, the glandular system, the endocrine system and all that, and it helps to rejuvenate one's innards. So it is not a must to find self-realization or integration, but if you love to do yoga, by all means, it's good exercise. Yeah, like you love to do jogging, that doesn't mean you must not meditate. You love to play a few sets of tennis, that doesn't mean you must stop playing tennis. No, by all means, carry on with yoga, nothing wrong with it. It can't do you any harm. And then slowly, as you carry on with your yoga practices, you could uh, make the mind and the body flow in total harmony. And that is one of the important aspects of Hatha Yoga. But it is not the end and aim of all. It is not the criteria or the panacea or whatever you want to call it. But it is good if you do it by all means to carry on. Swangan. You know, um, this editor, young man, came to him and brought him a poem. So the editor reads the poem. So he asks this young man, you wrote this? He says, yes, I did, sir. So the editor got up and shook his hand. I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Shakespeare. I thought you were dead 300 years ago. <laughs> yeah, more questions? No, oh, he's this bandit, he was robbing a bank. And he's, you know, um, takes, uh, we see this in movies on telly. Takes us his gun and tells the teller, quick, quick, give me all your money, because I've got, my parking meter has only given me 10 minutes. Hmm? Questions? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think I mentioned earlier that this is all very new to me, but uh, is there, are there different forms of meditation? No. There are thousands of forms of meditation, as there are thousands of different medicines. Now, we do not have one particular path of meditation. But as a doctor, knowing the thousands of different kinds of medita medicine would prescribe for you personally a particular kind. Therefore, what Jane would be meditating upon would not be the same kind of meditation which Jean would meditate upon. So there are thousands of different kinds of meditation practices, but each individual, as I said, a while ago, that no two people are alike. And if a person has a, a headache, you give him aspirin, you don't give him a penicillin shot. Hmm? And so, uh, meditational practices are given on an individual basis. So there are thousands and thousands of them. How many years ago, the clinic was allowed for um, Mm -hmm. Yes, naturally, there are only 16, 
So how can you tell another person your mantra because his mantra could be the same as yours if you're in the age group? But the real, but the real reason uh, I would tell you if I should give you a mantra based upon your vibration. Now this is how it works. Uh, you fill in a form giving details of age and address and telephone number and any particular requirement in your life, any particular long-term illness or any defect or whatever. This little form you fill in and you send a photograph to me you know, on that form via our teachers here. Our meditation is taught in two stages. First you get the preparatory practice which explains itself, it prepares you for the full practices. And then those forms are sent to me wherever I am and I go into deep meditation using your photograph point and going into the deep state of super consciousness which is beyond the time and space. I make direct contact with you and I would evaluate your spiritual state of evolution, your emotional, physical, biological, all the states, and um, you hear, I would hear a sound, because everything is vibration. You are nothing else but vibration. The stable is nothing else but vibration. And if you can reach the superconscious state, you could hear the vibration of everything, because they are functioning at different frequencies. Hmm? Uh, the stable you think it's standing still, but it is not. There are millions of molecules swirling and swirling around in it. And this motion and motion produces sound. It's the same what the Bible says. First was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God. So we get to that. I get to that level, uh, and if it has to be a mantra, or perhaps you might not even get a mantra, depending what you require. And then from that very sound I pick up, at that very subtle level, I bring that subtle sound to a grosser level where it becomes speakable and audible. And then you're shown methods, if it is a mantra, on how to use that mantra. And then you get other practices with it, which is done during the day without interfering with your work. But you do require for the mantra meditation, some other kind of meditation, you require one hour a day. Half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening, and your 23 hours during the day becomes richer. Dear say. Now, this is one of the things I told Maharishi. Is this that if you give someone a mantra, now that mantra, based on Bija mantra, seed sounds, Mm-hmm. Like Ram, Sham, Ing, Aum, Aum. Nevertheless, it might be a sound that does not, uh, would not be in harmony with the vortexes of energies that is within your body. They call it chakras. Mm-hmm. So you hammer a foreign sound which is not conducive to you and you keep on hammering, hammering it, what will happen is this, that it could be very harmful to you. I've, so when I went, when you invited me in 74, I found many, look, I don't say this in disparaging words, I'm too, um, and I never criticize anyone. I don't condemn and I don't condemn, but this, I'm telling you of an observation. Mm. Uh, I saw people walking around, they're like zombies, totally spaced out, instead of becoming integrated. The purpose of, in, of meditation or spiritual practices, rather, is to become integrated and not spaced out or fragmented. So that is the difference, and that is why I refused, Marisha. I say, I'm very sorry, I do not agree with your principles and your methods, and I'm not prepared to take over your movement. He told me he's getting old. He wants me to be around with him for a few years, so I could take over the movement. So after a while, uh, I said no in the beginning. After more chats for a few days, I said, yes, okay, I'll take it over. But on one condition, 
I'll change the entire system around. So he says, no, you've got to follow and teach the system which I have been teaching. Hmm? I said, no, sorry, not interested. Yes, eh? So uh, well, that is a generalized thing. Well, ours is totally individualized. For example, if you do get a mantra, and if you need a mantra, I mean, according to my assessment, uh, it will be a mantra which no one else will have. And not only that, but with that mantra goes a deep spiritual force directed to you, which is experienced by you. Hmm? That is important. And that is also another necessity why a guru is needed, because he does not only impart wisdom, knowledge, and shows the path, but he also imparts a spiritual force, because everything emanates. Hmm? And because of that, he directs a spiritual force to you, which is enlightening. It's like a balm on a terrible sore. It heals, soothes, and makes you feel better. Spurs you on further. Hmm? Dead. Uh, this fellow came from Italy, <clears throat> and he went into a restaurant to have a meal. So what he did, he took the table napkin and shoved it down his collar. Then, um, and here we in Canada, we Canadians don't allow that. So you put a napkin on your legs, fine. And so uh, the manager thought to himself, look, this does not look nice in my high-class restaurant. And so he called over one of his best waiters, and he says, look, you must be very tactful, and ask the man to remove that uh, napkin you know, from his neck. But you must be very tactful because we don't want to lose him as a customer and he's, he spends well whenever he comes. And so the waiter goes up to this man and he says, uh, uh, what would you like, a shave or a haircut? Questions? <laughs> 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 Another couple of jokes, yeah. Uh, the father was a, who wanted to test his son, who had just qualified as a lawyer. So uh, by that time, the clock had just struck one. So the father asked the son, trying to catch him out, the son, the lawyer. He says, look, if I take a hammer and smash this clock, would I be arrested? So the son says, definitely not. You will not be arrested. Hmm? Because it is self-defense. The clock struck first. <laughs> Good. Any more questions? Yes, sir. I'm curious, why do some people accept what you, what you say willingly? And why are there other people that, are, that would like to accept what you say? Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, you have this block. They don't. They wouldn't want this block here, but it is there. Yes. Why is that? That is very true. If I knew how to remove the block, then I would make this world into a totally different place, full, you know, that is filled now with so much strain and tension and suffering and misery. Sometimes I feel if it was like a boulder sitting on the world's chest and I could just pick it up and throw it away in the sea. People have these blocks because of their upbringing, the impressions deeply embedded in their subconscious mind, then the ego souls that are patterned into a belief system, and old patterns are very, very difficult to get rid of. Sometimes, like a dog, if his tail is curly, you can put that tail in an iron bar for a whole year. 
want to make it straight, but when you take the iron bar out, the tail will still curl up. Hmm? So, people are like that, unfortunately, so they are missing the beauty of life. <coughs> they have this block self created by the ego self, thinking, oh, well, what I think is right. Hmm? Well, what that guy, Guru Raj, says, you know, we make sense, but nevertheless, you know, I'm right, and some people are just not ready. And some people are. Hmm? So that's how it goes. And to me, if someone accepts or does not accept, I don't mind. Hmm? The gardener goes on planting seeds. Some fall on barren ground where they don't take fruit, some on fertile ground, and some on the rocks, and the birds of the air feed on them. But what is the duty of the gardener? He must keep on planting, keep on sowing. Hmm? And even if it sprouts in some little fertile patch, he has done his duty, for he is a gardener. And he tends the flowers with care and love. What's blocks, is he? It's a true teacher. He does not want to convert anyone. Businessmen do, not spiritual masters. He gives them the wisdom, the knowledge, the tools, and says, use it. You don't. It's your loss, perhaps. Who knows? Hmm? But through personal experience with the thousands of people around the world who are meditating and uh, who've been given individualized practices, I mean, they have gained fantastically well. Their lives have become smoother. And uh, that's all I can say. The proof of the pudding lies in the heat. Hmm? If you don't like the taste, chuck it away. But when the pudding is prepared by a master chef, you are sure to love it. Hmm. And the school teacher <coughs> skipped a red traffic light and was hauled in front of court. The judge was there, and the judge had a tough time with his school teacher when he was a young boy. So um, the accused says, the school teacher, he says, Sir, I'd be glad if you could finish my case first, uh, quickly, so I could go back to my class. The children are waiting. Uh, so the judge said, Oh, I see, you're a school teacher. I've been wanting to have a school teacher in my courtroom for, uh, for many years, and at last I've found one. So now you sit down right at that table, and you start writing 500 lines. I shall not go across a red light again. You know, this man went to a doctor and he complained about snoring. He says, you know, as soon as I fall asleep, I start snoring. So the doctor asks, does it disturb your wife? So the man says, oh, not only my wife, but, but the whole congregation. <laughs> <laughs> These two friends, they lived in a cabin in the mountain, cutting logs or whatever. This friend says, Horace, uh, why didn't you ever get married? So he says, well, you know, it didn't work out. The first girl I met, she was a redhead. And uh, I took her home and introduced her to my mother. But uh, my mother didn't like her, didn't like the way she talked. So the second girl I met was a pretty blonde and uh, who sang hillbilly songs. 
and things like that. Uh, and I took her and introduced her to my mother, and mother didn't seem to to like her because she didn't like her the way she behaved, you know, the hillbilly kind of thing. Right, and then I decided, Horace says, that let me try and find a girl who is something like my mother. So he found this girl, uh, and he took her home, and she walked like her mother, uh, nearly looked like her mother, talked like her mother. So um, the mother says, ah, yes, this girl would be good for you. Hmm? Then his friend asked, well, if that was the case, why didn't you get married? What was the trouble? He says, well, the trouble was this, that my dad could not stand the sight of her. <laughs> Here's an old one, which I said last night. Uh, there was these two nuns um, who ran out of gas, and the garage was... Um, half a mile away. So they rummaged through the car and the only container, you could have a container to bring gas, the only container they could find was a chamber pot. Hmm? You know, a chamber pot. Fine. So they took this chamber pot and uh, went to the garage, filled it up with petrol, gas. You call it gas, we call it petrol. Filled it up with gas and they were filling the tank with the gas. Now here two soldiers were passing by and they stood there looking at these nuns putting in the gas. So the one couldn't help himself. No. He said, respectfully of course, said, Madam, I don't think this will work, but I sure do admire your faith. <laughs> Well, it's half past ten. We've got more than an hour's driving to do. I'm staying in Aldergrove with our friend Carl Walters, who's one of our teachers here. And uh, he's a retired businessman, semi-retired. He lives on a farm, such a peaceful place in Aldergrove, and he's got his offices in town still. And then, of course, we have uh, Leslie Janos, the concert pianist I've mentioned. He's one of our teachers here. And uh, so is his lovely wife, Carolyn Janos. Um, she's a Bachelor of Arts in, in music and other fields of teaching. And uh, she teaches the flute. She's an expert flute player. As a matter of fact, all these videotapes that are being done of my stay here in the month's tour of Canada. Uh, her music would be included in the, 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 the front, what do you call that? With the titles and things are put on of the subject that's discussed and she's composing some lovely stuff for it with her husband, of course. So we have these teachers here. And those of you that are from Victoria, perhaps, we have teachers there as well. Uh, Hugh Hund, who's, a very, who's got a very top government position as a civil engineer. Hmm? And his wife, Barbara Hunt, is also a teacher. Then we have Larry Owens, who's a high school master, and um, responsible people. So uh, why I point this out is that do not think that this organization is just filled with a bunch of weirdos because we discourage that. We have stable, self-respecting, and respected people in the organization. Well, thank you. It's been so, so nice being with you. And hope to see you soon. This is my last talk in Vancouver. I done two at the Planetarium and one at the Unitarian Church. Um, and tonight here for public talks and had a course at UBS, is that what you call it? I'm holding a two-day intensive starting from 9 o'clock till 6 o'clock and it will be intensive. Mm. See if you can't become a better person in two days. A lot can be changed. For example, the communion practice which we do 
um, is when I go into the highest state of samadhi. Samadhi means the highest state of meditation. You do nothing, you just sit back and relax and just pay attention. And most people go through various kinds of experiences because in that samadhi, a terrific uh, spiritual force is generated. And in that samadhi, you become one with divinity. So naturally, uh, a very great spiritual force is generated. So for two days, I'll be there. That's Saturday and Sunday. Uh, Chetanji, 23rd, 24th, is it? Yeah, see, so any of you that could speak, it's a Saturday and Sunday, so you're off work. And if you could spare the time, it's to be held at University of Victoria. It's on the I-10 